consultants during financial crisis. In the face of the widespread financial market dislocations that began in August 2007, central banks have expanded liquidity operations, actively deploying their balance sheets to address all three types of liquidity shortages. While the inherent cause of the current crisis may be rooted in coordination failures and informational asymmetries, and so is not new, the scale and scope of the problem have necessitated measures in some countries that are clearly unprecedented. In particular, because institutions have come to depend on market-based sources of liabilities, replacing lost funding liquidity now requires interventions on a scale that is large relative to the size of the central bank's balance sheet in normal times. This section outlines the general thrust of central bank's actions from the perspective of their LOLR function. Each of the measures central banks have undertaken since the fall of 2007 can be seen as addressing directly or indirectly at least one of the three types of liquidity shortages. With respect to addressing shortages of central bank liquidity, the focus has been on accommodating the greater instability in the demand for reserves and alleviating distributional problems. These have been addressed by varying the size and frequency of operations, conducting them outside their regular schedule and in larger than usual amounts, broadening the number and type of counterparties, and enlarging the scope of eligible collateral. A key objective of these interventions has been to contain deviations of market rates from the official policy stance. For acute shortages of funding liquidity at specific institutions, central banks have extended emergency lending assistance to various financial institutions. This involved, for example, the extension of credit to Northern Rock by the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve support for Bear Stearns, AIG, and Citigroup, and the Swiss National Bank's financing of the transfer of distressed assets out of UBS. These actions were undertaken jointly with the fiscal authority and generally structured to minimize the financial risk to the central bank. Finally, there have been four broad components to efforts aimed at alleviating systemic shortages of funding and market liquidity. First, central banks have sought to ensure the availability of backstop liquidity to key financial institutions as reflected, for example, in the creation of the Federal Reserve's PDCF, which established overnight funding for primary dealers. Second, there has been an effort to provide greater assurance of the availability of term funding through the lengthening of the maturity on refinancing operations as well as the establishment of inter-central bank swap lines to ensure the availability of, primarily, dollar funding in offshore markets. Third, policymakers have worked to provide high-quality securities, usually sovereign ones, in exchange for lower quality, less liquid securities in order to encourage trading in the latter. The Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, for example, established facilities to lend government securities in exchange for less li liquid market securities. Fourth, there have been initiatives aimed at ensuring the availability of credit to non-banks in cases where particular financial markets have become inoperative. The Federal Reserve's extension of credit through the CPFF and the TALF, direct purchases of mortgage-backed securities issued by key government agencies, and the Bank of Japan's outright purchases of commercial paper are examples of such an approach. Over the past 16 months, central bank actions have covered this broad spectrum through two main phases. During the first phase, through mid-September 2008, central bank efforts were undertaken by varying the asset composition of their balance sheets while keeping the overall size largely unchanged. As the crisis intensified following the collapse of Lehman Brothers, central bank operations entered a second phase that involved a rapid expansion of the size of their balance sheets. In particular, as central banks increased the size and scope of their efforts to support market functioning and undertook larger emergency lending assistance, offsetting operations on the asset side of their balance sheets became constrained and it was necessary to expand the capacity of reserve draining instruments on the liability side. During the fall of 2008, the assets of the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England more than doubled in a matter of weeks, while those of the European Central Bank increased by more than 30%. In the case of the Federal Reserve, the growth in assets was driven by larger-term operations, new lending facilities, and dollar swaps with other central banks. For the European Central Bank and the Bank of England, the expansion was driven mainly by repos and auctions of dollar liquidity. On the liability side, the increase in balance sheet capacity of the Federal Reserve came from bank reserves and a one-off injection in the Treasury account. For the European Central Bank, the primary offsetting instrument has been the, de the deposit facility, whereas the Bank of England has increasingly relied on the issuance of central bank bills. 135 years ago, Walter Badgett wrote that, to stay a banking panic, one, the bank supplying reserves, must advance freely and vigorously to the public. Two, these loans should only be made at a very high rate of interest, and three, at this rate these advances should be made on all good banking securities, and as largely as the public ask for them. From these basic principles, central banks derived the theory of the lender of last resort. But Badgett lived in a different world, not only were there no automobiles, airplanes, or computers, but there were very few central banks, fewer than 20, whereas today there are more than 170.
Since central banks are essentially a 20th century phenomenon, it is natural to ask whether Bagehot's 19th century doctrine still applies. In this paper, we have argued that Bagehot's view of the lender of last resort requires modification. As the financial system has gained in complexity, so have all facets of the role of central banks. Following the trail blazed by Bagehot, we refine the theory of the LOLR by identifying three types of liquidity shortages that can occur in the modern financial system. 1. A shortage of central bank liquidity, 2. An acute shortage of funding liquidity at a specific institution, and 3. A systemic shortage of funding and market liquidity. Our analysis leads us to conclude that the appropriate principles for central banks LOLR support must be conditioned on the particular type of liquidity shortage that is taking place. When confronted with a simple shortage of central bank liquidity, for example, Bagehot's dictum applies. By contrast, a systemic event almost surely requires lending at an effectively subsidized rate compared with the market rate while taking collateral of suspect quality. In the same way, any discussion of communication policy in the potential future application of LOLR policy, such as the desirability of constructive ambiguity, must be linked to a specific type of liquidity shortage. So, for example, while ambiguity of access to central bank liquidity may be an important countervailing force against moral hazard in situations of acute institution-specific liquidity shortages, it is likely to be counterproductive when it comes to dealing with general shortages of central bank liquidity or while in the midst of a systemic crisis. In terms of the debate outlined earlier on the appropriate form of LOLR lending, the current crisis has made it abundantly clear that the argument that only open market operations are needed to meet the liquidity needs of fundamentally sound banks is flawed since money markets themselves can fail to function properly. This is even more so in light of recent developments in the financial system that have increased the interdependencies between financial institutions and markets, and made it more imperative that central banks be prepared for situations in which both experience problems simultaneously.